Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the seventh of our special webinar series on the impact of the pandemic on women and girls in developing countries. This series aimed to engage researchers, policymakers, and practitioners on matters around women's empowerment and the impacts of the pandemic and associated economic crisis has on women in, it, in the global south. This is now our seventh webinar, so our previous six webinars have highlighted that the dual health and economic crisis triggered by COVID-19 has not only underscored existing gender gaps, but also widened those gaps. Women and girls around the globe have disproportionately suffered in the last six months and will continue to do so. While our previous webinars have focused on different themes, today we focus on a specific population, migrant women and girls in those refugee settings. Many of the research priorities and policy implications we've had seen so far are complicated and present their own challenge for this particular vulnerable population. Forced migrants and refugees have fewer resources and access to social protection services, even before the pandemic hit. So uh, the feasibility of non-pharmaceutical interventions such as the lockdown and stay-at-home orders are impractical, especially in crowded refugee camps that are normally meet, if at all, all basic needs. And of course, data collections is notoriously difficult. We'll hear from our four panelists today who will speak to us about recent trends, practical solutions, and on the ground experience in the pandemic. The Empowerment and Development Lab at McGill University is immensely grateful for the support of Canada's International Development Research Centre through its Growth and Economic Opportunity for Women, GROW. GROW is a five-year action research program jointly funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and RDRC. This program was created to find scalable solutions for advancing gender equality in the world of work. Working with partners in East Africa, this program focuses on these three areas, through our, though our series itself takes a more global approach. The three areas are addressing and gender segregation and employment, reducing and redistributing unpaid care work, unleashing women's collective agency. While we are meeting virtually, the series and the Women Empowerment and Development Lab are hosted by McGill University, and McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of exchange among indigenous people, including the other Nosomi and the Anishinaabeg nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations by the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we are meeting virtually today. Before we introduce our panel, uh, let me go through uh, some of the rules of today. Each panel member will have 15, member, uh, 15 minutes to deliver her presentations. It will be followed by the question and answer period that will be moderated by uh, Leva Rouhani. And in order to ask questions uh, to our panel members, please use at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a toolbar and there's a Q&A uh, icon that you can click and please use it to ask the questions. And on that part then you'll be able to ask the questions and uh, our panel members will endeavor to answer these questions uh, at the end of uh, the presentations. So without further ado, let me introduce the first member of our panel today, Rachel Kendall Monroe from MSF. Rachel Kendall Monroe is a lawyer and activist specializing in humanitarian assistance, global health, governance, and bioethics. She has a long history of humanitarian work, which began in 1989, where she left her legal practice to work on indigenous rights in East Timorese independence with grassroots organizations in Indonesia. She then joined Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF, in various uh, missions across the world, so Djibouti, Rwanda, Democratic Republic of Congo. She also led the MSF Access in Medicines campaign in Canada until 2007, and she became in, in 2007 for medicine, and she's mostly served as director of MSF International Board, its highest governance platform. 
In 2013, McGill was invited to be a professor of practice at McGill University, where she lectures on international development, humanitarian action, and access to medicine. So she not only works for MSF, she's also a colleague of mine. Rachel, without further ado, please go with your presentation. Thank you, Frank. Let me just uh, share my screen. So good morning, everyone, and thanks very much to uh, Isid for inviting me and the WED Lab for inviting me to, to speak on this. Um, just to add in uh, something that wasn't in the introduction, since uh, 2018, I've been running, uh, set up a, a, a non-profit organization called Sea Change Initiative, which works on um, supporting communities to empower themselves in terms of their response to health crises. And I'm going to be focusing um, a lot on that today as, as I talk. Um, I wanted to start um, by something that I've been thinking about a lot recently about COVID-19 as, as being the ultimate disruptor. Um, we've seen how it's devastated the lives of communities, uh, individuals, and it's, we've also seen how it's led to governments reacting in kind of knee-jerk and often archaic ways with their public health policies. There was an interesting editorial in the Globe and Mail this morning about exactly that and how opportunities to be able to address this pandemic have been missed on many occasions. We've seen really how we have this lack of emergency preparedness in our country. And we've also seen globally a real lack of solidarity and a lack of um, mutual aid, as well as a growth of nationalism with this sort of idea of each for his own and these kind of blanket responses that don't acknowledge any of the particularities of different situations and different people. We've been thinking about how COVID-19 has also revealed multiple pandemics. It's not only the pandemic of COVID-19, but it's revealed underneath the pandemic of racism, a pandemic of poverty. We've got the ongoing pandemic of climate and environmental destruction. So as well as showing these things, COVID-19 has also exposed an opportunity an opportunity for us to have a paradigm shift in the way that we do things, in the way that we make policy. Because I think that COVID-19, by really exposing and revealing those things that we have preferred to leave unseen, has given us this small window of opportunity which we need to seize and which we can really make a change. And I think it's really a once in a lifetime opportunity that we need to seize. And that's why I think it's the ultimate disruptor. And I want to focus on that and show how communities have really been at the front line of this COVID-19 pandemic. And also, I believe, in the front line of what we need to see in terms of a paradigm shift. So this quote from Antonio Guterres, the Internet UN Secretary, United Nations Secretary of was very revealing. He talks about how we're all floating on the same sea, but some of us are in super yachts and others, others of us are clinging to drifting debris. COVID-19 has exacerbated these existing vulnerabilities. So, and where communities were already very vulnerable and isolated before the pandemic, they face even greater risks through the pandemic. I wanted to start by talking, a story, telling you a story about a woman called Gloria, who I met actually about a, two years ago now uh, in a migrant shelter in the south of Mexico, in Tenosiki. She had fled from El Salvador with two of her children. And when I met her in Tenosiki, she told me the most harrowing story of how when she, the reasons that she'd left home and then what had happened to her since she'd been in Mexico. When she left home, it was because gangs were trying to uh, engage her son in gang activities. And they'd also pointed out, also sort of fixated on her daughter as becoming one of the wives of one of the gang members. And um, Gloria knew what the impacts of that would be on her family and she didn't want her children to fall into that gang life like she'd seen so many others. So she decided to leave um, overnight and she fled uh, up towards Mexico hoping that there in Mexico she would find shelter and refuge and safety from all the violence that she had been exposed to and her family had been exposed to in El Salvador. When she arrived uh, in Mexico, uh, she had just crossed the border and she was kidnapped by Mexican gangs, uh, where she was brutally raped, 
um, where they um, demanded amounts of money from her family who were in the United States. And this was all meanwhile with her two children who watched on and her daughter who was 16 years old at the time was also five months pregnant. So when she arrived in the migrant shelter when she was released, um, she was extremely traumatized and her daughter and her son were barely speaking. This is the story of so many women that are having to are forced to flee from the crisis in Central America, not only from El Salvador, but also from Honduras, also from Guatemala. According to the Mexican immigration authorities, in 2019, 30% of the asylum seekers in Mexico were women, and then another 13% were adolescents and children. Already in the first months of 2020, the rate of asylum seekers in Mexico has increased by 34% over the same period in 2019. Care and UN Women have estimated that COVID-19 could push 15, nearly 16 million more people in the Central American region into extreme poverty, or in Latin America into extreme poverty, which would bring the, about third, bring the total to around 34% of the entire population living in Latin America who would be pushed into poverty. So the situation is only going to get worse more people in Central America are going to be forced to flee. So while at the moment um, we estimate there's around half a million people fleeing every year into Mexico from the Central American region, that is probably going to get worse. And even those statistics, that statistic of half a million is probably an underestimate because those are the only the people that we see. And we've seen that in um, that migration, refugees and migrants are, have been put at extreme risk. Health services are often extremely limited and they're focused primarily now on COVID-19. And so that means that women's access to sexual and reproductive health is very limited. And given the story of Gloria, which is the story of many women, access to sexual and reproductive health is extremely important. Refugees and migrant women are often afraid to report domestic violence that they have due to their status as a migrant. We know that 70% of migrant, work, migrant women are often domestic workers and are often suffering abuse in those domestic environments. And from statistics, sexual violence against female migrants in Mexico has doubled in the first few months of 2020. We also see that inside the migrant shelters, women are much more vulnerable to sexual exploitation and violence. One of the problems as well is migrant shelters like the pictures I'm showing you here of La Setenta y Dos, which is the migrant shelter in, in Tennessee, where I met Gloria. And the one here on the right is a migrant shelter um, in Ixtepec, in, uh, further up in the Oaxaca region of Mexico. And the situation in those migrant shelters is very difficult. They're often run by, they're mainly run by volunteers or by church groups, and they've been forced because of COVID-19 to shut their doors um, to basically protect the population that's inside um, the migrant shelter, which means that people arriving, people like Gloria who are arriving are not able to seek shelter inside. I was speaking most recently with the health director in Itztepec in this uh, migrant shelter I'm showing on the right. And she honestly said that they didn't know what to do with the migrants because the local migrant shelter had been closed. So all that they could think of doing was giving them a mask and giving them a bottle of water and asking them to move on. So imagine if everyone in if all the migrants who are arriving and refugees who are arriving in the different cities are just being asked to move on, it becomes nobody's problem and everyone remains vulnerable. In Tenosique, we had a situation recently where they had um, sent some tests to the local hospital for some people that they suspected to be COVID-19 positive. They were told to wait three days and they would hear the results of the test and if they didn't hear, they shouldn't call. They didn't hear back after they assumed that everything was okay and those people carried on circulating in the migrant shelter. But then when they called seven days later, the hospital said, oh, actually, no, the tests were positive. You do have, COVID. those people do have COVID-19. So in that time, COVID-19 had been able to spread inside the, inside the shelter. So these are some of the realities that those um, shelters are having to live with. And we also need to look at the impact of the closing borders. 
Um, you know, we go from, especially on that border between Mexico and the US, so when people are trying to travel up, they arrive in towns like Matamoros or Mexicali or Nueva Laredo. And this is a photograph from uh, Tijuana, um, where you see the wall here uh, with the US. Um, and a colleague of mine, who I think is on the call, Jessica Faber, took this photo when she was there earlier this year and had to come back because of the COVID-19. But Tijuana is labeled one of the most dangerous cities in the world and it has one of the highest rates of homicide. And to add, that, add to that, it has one of the highest rates of femicide in the world. Yet people who are arriving in Tijuana, forced to flee their homes in Central America, have nowhere to go. They're stuck in Tijuana or Matamoros or Mexicali or Nueva Lareda. And even prior to COVID-19, over, um, um, we're seeing that the more migra migrants are having to undertake irregular crossings, trying to get through illegally, having to use um, people to help them to go across. And that's happening now even more. Central America, of course, is just one part of the global picture of problems that have been created by COVID-19. And just to name a few, we know there's very little data, uh, COVID-19 data that's been broken down according to sex. We know that there's been a rollback in women's rights. We know that there's been increased food security. Um, and for instance, in El Salvador, it's over 60% of families are reporting food shortages. We know that women are often the ones to feel the economic losses first. Um, in Palestine, for instance, one in two women have lost all of their income because of COVID-19. One in two women, it's huge. Uh, and then the rates of gender-based violence have increased from Colombia to Zimbabwe, and the quarantine makes it much harder to track those cases. And in terms of health, which is the area that I focus on, women really are at the front lines because they make up 70% of the workers in the health and social sector globally often receiving lower pay than men, and in many cases, they receive no pay at all. So I painted a very negative picture, so there are there solutions? Well, that's what we're hoping at Sea Change that we've been um, managed to do. We've created a community-first COVID-19 roadmap. We see that Communities are at the front line, and in order to be able to address COVID-19, they need to be supported to find the power to respond. And they need to be empowered through various things, through information, through resources, through coaching and support, and also through um, the capacity to build their own emergency plan. Having worked in 25 years in emergency preparedness, it's not rocket science. It's really about being organized, having a committee, having a group of people who take in charge the preparation, and then having the resources and the staff around to be able to implement that into place. And we're hoping that by using this uh, community first approach, by using this COVID-19 roadmap, this is an example of really what community centered and community led means in practice. And to have a look at what that means, the roadmap basically takes people through these different steps of organize, prepare, respond. And now we have also this step of recover and reimagine life after the COVID-19 pandemic or during the current um, COVID-19 pandemic. And so this, um, this very practical tool is directed at isolated and vulnerable groups who are receiving very little help from authorities or health centers. And we believe it's a tool that's extremely relevant for refugee and migrant communities who are the groups that are left to the side of, um, of the health care, for instance, in countries like Mexico, but even here in Canada. And they need to be more self-organized and they need to be more autonomous in preparing for and re responding to COVID-19 and other um, pandemics. And so this is really feeding into the idea of broader systemic change. Um, the vision that we have is that we need to start moving away from this very top-down health system where there's a very centralized authority that is putting out general public health uh, um, requirements for the whole population and rather turning it around and seeing well how do populations themselves communities who are vulnerable and isolated 
what do they have, what tools do they have in their own communities to help them to face the pandemic. And when they're able to start increasing their resilience and their ability to face up to it, it means that they can meet health authorities in a new place and already be helping to protect their own communities. So I look forward to your questions and answers and thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, Joel, and telling us about uh, CHT in 2018. This is great. Um, as I remind the participants that there is going to be a Q&A session, and if you have questions, please uh, post them on the Zoom icon, and you'll be able to uh, get the questions in there, and we'll use them. Our next uh, panelist is Jane Leinekard from Mixed Migration Center. She's the Global Coordinator for MI, the Mixed Migration Center's flagship primary data collection project. The project has, since 2014, collected around 40,000 interviews with refugees and migrants on the move, providing insights to humanitarian and development programs, as well as policymakers. Before working with MMC, Jane worked in research and analysis at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, and with ACAPS, or ACAPS, focusing on humanitarian needs analysis. She also spent years with MSF, and at the United Nations Institute of Disarmament Research. Jane, the panel is yours now. Hi, thanks very much. Thanks. It's a great opportunity to, uh, to listen to all these different perspectives. It's uh, nice to be part of this. Thank you. Um, let me just see if I can share my screen. And you should have. Here we are. I finished have my presentation. So, um, yeah, I'm going to present um, something of what 4MI does. So, um, 4MI is the Mixed Migration Monitoring Mechanism Initiative. Um, and yeah, we're focusing on mixed migration, a very particular population of uh, women and men and children on the move. Um, not all have the legal status of refugee. It's a very particular setting and a particular population. Uh, I want to start off with uh, describing that population, um, who MMC is and what we've been doing, and then present some initial findings for, from the data that we're collecting. Uh, from this population, contrasting women's needs um, and experiences and perceptions of, of the impact of COVID-19 against uh, those of the broader population. So the Mixed Migration Centre is a knowledge centre that's part of the Danish Refugee Council and we're here to inform practice and policy about mixed migration um, and we have a, a strong focus on protection aspects. The easiest way perhaps to present this is, is by sharing our definition of mixed migration, which is why I've put it up here. Um, we're referring to international migration, cross-border movements of people. Um, and these are mixed, so people can have different legal statuses and they can have different motivations for moving. We also have a variety of vulnerabilities. Um, we take this mixed migration lens because despite their different statuses, um, and different motivations, they'll be traveling along similar routes um, and using similar means and, and will go through uh, similar experiences. Uh, it's important, I think, before I start showing you some of our data to underline the type of population and, and the specificities of collecting data amongst uh, migrants and refugees. Um, it's a very difficult to reach population. Um, it's very heterogeneous and you can be in one country trying to find out what's uh, the situation for, for um, migrants and refugees, um, but it's, it's going to be difficult because they'll be speaking multiple languages in multiple areas. Um, they're also very mobile and often um, if people have a regular status, they won't want to be found 
so they're um, highly um, difficult to find, difficult to access, but at the same time highly vulnerable. And this combination of factors is what led to the development of 4MI, which started in 2014 in East Africa um, and has evolved since then to, um, in 2020, just before COVID hit, uh, we had about 130 monitors uh, conducting interviews with refugees and migrants face-to-face -face, uh, across multiple migration routes um, in, in around 16 countries around the world. When COVID-19 hit, um, we had to cease data collection, obviously, um, but the urge and the need for the data was if anything more important because of the rapidly evolving situation and how it was impacting on refugees and migrants. Um, so it, now um, we moved uh, as rapidly as we could to remote recruitment of respondents um, in our survey and to remote data collection uh, via telephone. Uh, and we were able to maintain data collection in 14 countries. Uh, we developed a new survey instrument to find out more about the impact of COVID as fast as we could, and we collect uh, around more than 2,000 interviews per month since then. Uh, it's important um, for me to underline the limitations of our data. Obviously, there's bias in recruitment. Um, the fact that we're doing telephone interviews means you need access to a phone, um, but we try to take we do take a number of measures to mitigate these potential biases. Um, the data is not representative. Um, we, the data is quantitative, uh, but, uh, but it's not representative because of the sampling that we have to take. So all the findings that I'm presenting here are confined to the sample. It's, our sample's not representative because it can't be, because we don't know the population, because it's hard to access and hidden and mobile and all those other things. But it's also deliberate because we want to get data on as many different profiles of people moving as possible. Um, and this includes uh, looking at gender. Um, so we have at the moment 33% of monitors collecting 4MI data are women and 38% of our respondents are women. There is um, correlation between whether uh, uh, the, the gender of our monitors uh, and the, the responses we're getting. Um, we are conducting this quantitative data collection because we have a lot of rich qualitative data around, um, but we need to understand the issues at scale. And so we think what we're doing is very complementary. There's a drive for sex delegated data uh, I think it's improving, but it's not necessarily being shared and it's not necessarily being analysed. Um, and um, research design is not always really deliberately considering gender, particularly when you're looking at um, vulnerable populations. So I think this is something that I'll come back to at the end. So while uh, I present our data um, globally, um, we cover a lot of issues. It's very broad. Um, we're, we're trying to, to find out as much as possible about refugees and migrant situation and journeys. Um, we can't cover the more sensitive issues for ethical reasons, um, and we, but we can cover a, a range of levels. We collect data from, so we can look at it from a, glo a global perspective. And I'm going to try and do a cross-regional perspective as I'm doing here, but also we can go down to, to a very detailed local perspective and that can be extremely useful, uh, especially for programming. So today I'm going to provide some initial findings from two regions um, based on a recent data set um, to provide some, some pointers, hopefully, on the different uh, effects that the crisis is having on, on women uh, compared to men. Um, it's only a fraction of what we've got um, and we'll be doing some fuller analysis, uh, uh, which will be uh, published in the autumn. First, uh, I wanted to look at a, a much discussed topic of domestic violence, which statistics are very widely, uh, fairly widely available in, in a lot of developed countries, uh, industrialized countries, but um, we don't have much for, for these more vulnerable populations where we expect the situation to be worse. We're, we're not collecting ourselves uh, data on personal experiences of domestic violence, but we do at least try to gauge the perception uh, of the scale of the problem. Um, so recent data, what I'm presenting here is from uh, North Africa and West Africa. 
And on the, the left hand side, you'll see uh, votes from all respondents on how far they agree with the statement of an increase in incidents of domestic violence uh, since the pandemic began. Um, so it's almost half that agree that there has been an increase and that's uh, across the full sample. Uh, and then when I split it up um, between men and women, you'll see it's much larger for women, perhaps uh, to be expected, but it, it's at 59%. So, so these numbers are quite, um, quite striking. If I move to another impact that has been had globally, if we look at loss of income, uh, it's interesting to see um, for our population on the move, which is particularly vulnerable to loss of income. They're far more likely to be working in the informal sector than, than many other populations, and they're far less likely to, to have the support of, of state networks or informal social networks if they lose income. Uh, from what we see here, it seems or suggests that women uh, are more dependent on work. Um, you can see that um, pure women, a uh, smaller proportion of women said they had no income before the pandemic and uh, a smaller proportion of women said they'd lost income from, from loss of financial support. More women, only a slight, uh, slightly larger number, but more women did um, say that they've lost income from loss of work. We asked questions uh, related to protection and perceptions of risk. So looking uh, again at the, the world of work um, and the risk of labor exploitation since the pandemic began, women are far more concerned than men about labor exploitation. Um, but then there are um, differences between regions. Um, uh, as I note here, there's, there's more, far more frequent agreement with this statement in, amongst respondents, uh, in North, women respondents in North Africa than in West Africa. Um, and I think this, this difference is something that I'll look at later and I think it's important for us, for us to remember the particularity of situations which Rachel also referred to. And if we look at sexual exploitation, we'll see again that women agree more frequently, but uh, there's, there's a much starker difference. Uh, with, with men's opinion on the, the risk of sexual exploitation since the pandemic began. Um, if I go back to loss of income and its, and its impacts in particular, um, I wanted to, uh, to talk about the fact that there's not a huge amount of difference between men and women and perhaps on two issues. Women are more likely to say that they're using up their savings and more likely to talk about worry and anxiety as an impact of loss of income. There's a few smaller differences, um, but I, I, I want to wait for more data till we, till we can make any more, draw many conclusions on that. But again, it's about regional distance differences. Um, in North Africa, it's actually inverse. There's women are more concerned about uh, access to basic goods. Uh, and in West Africa, uh, it's more men that are reporting loss of housing. So it really is important to drill down and look at particular regions, countries, and specific populations. So when we look at how the impacts vary from place to place, I think it's been useful to see the day-to-day -day impacts of the crisis. Um, I've chosen three issues where access to asylum, for example, is a much bigger issue in North Africa uh, than in West Africa, uh, according to our respondents. Um, but it's much bigger for women in North Africa than for men. And then in West Africa, it's while it's less of an issue, it's more of an issue for men than women. So it is important to, to look at these different levels. Um, and just because the difference between the regions is greater than the difference between the genders, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at gender as well. Um, and I, I think that's something that I, I really want to emphasize. The availability of basic goods. Again, you have differences between the regions. It's more important for, for women. It's more frequently cited as an issue in North Africa. In West Africa, it's more cited as an issue by men. Stress and anxiety is a strong uh, concern across the board. Uh, slightly less so amongst men in West Africa. 
the last uh, set of the data I wanted to look at is needs. Needs are extremely high across the board. We have 85 to 90% of respondents saying that they need extra help, and that's across all regions and across genders. Um, a higher percentage of women tend to receive assistance than men. But again, this varies a lot by region, um, how much they're receiving, and clearly it's not meeting uh, the level of need. Whether it's the right kind of assistance is also another question that, that needs to be investigated. In West Africa, our teams had a look at what women needed. Um, women were more likely to say they needed cash and they needed protective equipment and sanitary materials than men. They less frequently were looking for information on COVID or basic relief items, uh, food, shelter, water. So to close, um, what can we do? Um, I, I'm looking at this more from a research perspective. I think it's really important that we continue to work hard to reach the very hard to reach. It's hard to reach migrants and refugees on the move, but that doesn't mean we should be satisfied when we reach some. We need to reach um, the full breadth of the population. We need to find out what's happening amongst so many more specific populations and the differences between them within the migrant and refugee population. We need to be really careful about our assumptions and programming and planning. Some of our results are, are surprising, um, even for the experts in, the, in these areas. So uh, I think that's something we need to pay attention to as well. And then analyze the data from women and share it at all levels. I know that there's quite a lot of sex disaggregated data out there. I haven't seen a huge amount of analysis according to gender so far. And, and I think we need to work harder to get that out and, and to get it shared. Um, we need to, to meet the needs hear the needs that are being voiced by women uh, and we need to make them there, there, there needs to be protection from abuse the right to asylum needs to be safeguarded for everybody and assistance programs need to be inclusive um, they, they can't miss out these more hidden populations who don't necessarily fit the established categories and with that i will stop thank you very much um, i look forward to the rest Thank you very much, Jane. It's very interesting. It's great to be able to have data. And of course, when we think about policy, we need to know what's happening right now on the, on the ground. So uh, uh, Mixed Migration Center provides some of these answers. And of course, we're going to hopefully do this for now for thinking about policy. Our next speaker is Selena Vesola from Glasswing International. Uh, Selena co-founded Glauswing International, an organization that addresses the root causes of poverty and violence in 10 Latin American countries through education, health, and community development. Selena has more than 23 years of experience in social change, including emergency response in conflict zones and disasters, public health, and philanthropic consulting. Selena is a school awardee. She's a fellow of the Obama Foundation, Ashoka, and Lego Foundations. She's also a Talbert Global Leader. She serves on several nonprofit boards and is a member of the International American Foundations Advisory Council. She holds a master's degree in public, master's degrees in public health, sorry, and social work from Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania. And she loves nature and wildlife. So, Selena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, you, Prof Professor Grimard and Leva, uh, Wed Lab, and ICID for having us here. This is a really great opportunity to learn from my peers on the panel, and I'm looking forward to staying in touch. I'm going to try to get, okay, there we go. Thank you so much again. Um, I think this has been really, I'm glad Rachel presented the uh, so much information about Central America and so many of those stories and the data that Jane presented us with is really valuable. So I look forward to hopefully complementing some of the things they were discussing. I think I'm going to, I'm in El Salvador right now. I'm from El Salvador and I'm going to start, I'm going to focus on Latin America, but particularly start with the context that we're facing even before COVID and kind of that baseline of uh, emergency that we had um, with the migration crisis, but also just with the rates of violence. As you can see from the slide, we have a huge proportion of the homicides globally are in Latin America. The feminicide rate here in El Salvador is the highest in the world. And there's also just ongoing persecution of different groups that are 
that were pre-existing. And now this, a lot of this has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, as several of the, both panelists mentioned the increases in domestic violence. I think even though it's still underreported, we really need to understand that better as well. Migration, uh, right now, you know, we had since 2014, a huge increase in the number of unaccompanied minors. The, the demographics of migrants has been changing gradually to more family units. It isn't just adult males. And right now, there have been tens of thousands of people deported back to their countries of origin from which they left forcefully uh, because of violence, because of lack of opportunities, economic opportunities, but mainly because they were at risk and severe risk. So right now with the deportations, they just released information, the IRC, that over 20% of those detained in ICE have COVID. So there are obviously epidemiological impl implications also of the deportation and we're really concerned. Um, just yesterday actually or no on saturday we you know one of the countries we work in you can get a sense from the numbers i have on the screen the profile of deportees and and there's so many family units there are company unaccompanied minors as little as two three years old so we are really concerned about how that reintegration process is going to take place and addressing the excuse me the trauma that these individuals have faced some of the health impacts we're seeing from our community health programs, we work within the public system. So we work in public clinics, public hospitals. There has always been a stigma related to de de deportees, returnees, but now it's not just this focus on, oh, you know, those who are being deported or involved in lives of crime, they're criminals, they're coming from US prisons. But now there's a stigma uh, and, and this discrimination and a perception that, that people who are being deported are vectors of COVID, vectors of disease. So it's getting even worse, the discrimination and the violence against returnees. So we're really trying to figure out how to mitigate that at a community level. The rates of trauma, although we are lacking data um, and a really rigorous assessment of the levels of trauma, there is evident mental health distress in communities already, which is exacerbated by the pandemic, and then the fears pointed in every direction. Um, apparently, because right now, the numbers, they're estimating that up to 18 million women, because they're afraid to go to health clinics because of the pandemic, they're afraid to get COVID, up to 18 million women in Latin America and the Caribbean won't access uh, reproductive health services, which is you know, really severe. And this includes getting emergency help related to violence, maternal child health. So we're working, we're trying to work, I think, in public system, civil society, the community of practice in general, we're trying to work on, on making sure people feel okay with going to the health facilities to make sure that these ongoing challenges are being addressed because the systems nationally are overwhelmed. Um, the impact of, of the economic impact, I think we're all feeling it globally, um, and particularly with populations that live on the daily wages and of selling food. This family in, in Villanueva in Guatemala, it's an ur peri urban commu uh, community, they live off of daily wages. So this has really affected their family. It's a family of 10 people. And, and this, you know, that really drives people into extreme poverty, people who would normally be working every single day and generating income to at least get by. Another really big concern we have is that there's a projected decline in remittances and remittances can represent up to 20% of the um, GDP in some of these countries. So women are the biggest recipients of, of remittances and we are concerned that this will have an even longer lasting and deeper impact on communities, particularly those that are already facing uh, crises and, and risks. Um, one of the other issues that we've been seeing and that we're really concerned about is that we know that women in general really bear the main, the brunt of just household duties. It's unpaid work. And right now during COVID, this, this has become exacerbated. Women are isolated at home, oftentimes with, in, in conditions of risk, um, uh, perhaps their partner, there's situations of violence. We're really concerned about adolescent girls who are now bearing the, you know, even more weight on domestic duties and very few of them will be able to connect to uh, remote learning because of the lack of access to, to reliable connectivity. But that isolation really 
adds and adds layers of risk. Um, the, the fact that women and girls can't access the protections is worrying. And, and I think Jane said this earlier, that migrant women and girls, people on the move, whether they're IDPs or deported or, you know, they're, once they leave the, the facilities, the migrate, when they return and they're processed and they go back to their communities, they essentially become invisible to the system. So they disappear and it's very hard to reach them. And, and they're in debt. They're in debt to coyotes. They're in debt. You know, they paid for these, these trips. And, and so now they're almost just in this situation of servitude that is really, really risky and they're in, they're in danger. So oftentimes they do not want to be found because they are also afraid. Um, and, and it's very difficult difficult to reach out to them as organizations if they don't have cell phones and they're they're difficult to to find because of their because of their um the fear and and rightly so them trying to get through and survive these moments <clears throat> The systems really nationally are not in place. They're not in place institutionally. So all these inequalities are exacerbated right now. During COVID, the resources are often centralized in cities. They're not decentralized. The governments to make decisions are not, um, not leveraging the community health organizations or definitely not communities themselves. So we're really concerned that these, and I think both my co-panelists already mentioned that, that we're ignoring the unique populations, the unique needs of populations that are on the move. We're not looking at this through gender lens in terms of policy, and we're not taking into account um, the, real, the conditions that people are facing right now. Some of the work we're doing in the region includes not only emergency response, which we didn't do before. So we're combining food aid with um, mental health kits and personal protective equipment, but we're also trying to work in communities to continue our girls programming, even if it's remote, even if it's WhatsApp or text, but really trying to maintain a sense of connection to combat the trauma. And we're also working through our community health programming to encourage women to continue accessing care um, and, and inform them about the, the risks and the precautions they can take to prevent transmission. The, the issue we're seeing, um, we've been working with the national child protection authorities to see how we can partner and, and strengthen the services that are being provided and those that are not being provided. So we're working closely with the protection agencies, but also understanding from a client-centered approach what, what children and adolescents that are being returned to the country, what their situation is and what they need. So aside from training, providing training on trauma-informed care to the, the government employees and self-care, so we're trying to really really approach this in terms of an ecosystem, a trauma-informed ecosystem. We're, so we're providing that training, but you know, what we're seeing is we need to make sure that even government employees have the information and the access to the tools and, uh, and, and skills that they need to be able to provide better care. So when uh, people who are deported, they're put into quarantine for about a week in El Salvador at least, and then once, and they're tested for COVID, and once they're returned, they either go back with their families or they're put into the system if they're not, if the, if they're not able to go back to their communities because of risks. So across that whole pathway, we're trying to help the institutions provide the support, and then also they can refer them to our teams to provide ongoing mental health support through tablets or other digital devices or just cell phones. So we're trying to really continue and do more case management in the reintegration of the unaccompanied minors in particular. And this has been proven to be obviously a big challenge. My apologies. I have all the doors closed, but my dog is loud. Um, so we're really trying to focus on this well-being as a more integrated concept. Um, because of the lack of uh, data that we're, we were all discussing, we're, we're excited to start with IDRC, ASEAS, and other local research uh, think tanks and research institutions. We really want to get a better sense of what return migrants are facing in the context of COVID. So we'll be doing that um, over the course of the next 18 months or so, uh, 24 months. And we want to really be client-centered. We have to make sure in our research that we're speaking to those who have been returned, those who are on the move, populations who are displaced. And, um, you know, there's so many, this whole 
really during this pandemic, we have this whole population of de facto IDPs, essentially, they can't repatriate, they can't go back to their countries, even if it's just a couple hours away between Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico is further away, but there's this, the closing of borders really makes this difficult. So it's really understanding this from the perspective of, of the populations themselves and, at, and seeing how we can activate, in our case, how we can activate these local systems of, of prevention, of detection and, and referrals um, that, uh, you know, I think Rachel talked about earlier too, to empower communities, to take more of a, more agency in, in this process. Um, in terms of the, the research that we think is really important and we, we, we don't feel like we've seen enough of, one is just, you know, locally uh, contextualized research so we understand the differences uh, between what's happening in, in one country and another, even between urban and rural. We're not really understanding all of the differences yet. We don't have enough information. So we need to understand this, this, the new, this new human mobility given the, the border closings um, and the, the constraints that COVID has placed. We also want to get a sense of what community programming, um, whether it's driven by civil society, by individuals, by women's groups, what is working? Um, religious institutions or government, but what is working to prevent and mitigate the impacts of COVID, the social economic, the impacts on violence and trauma during this pandemic. Um, and finally, we, we, we really believe that it's important to do more um, participatory action research. So how do we involve girls and young women and women in driving the research and the priorities to understand the impacts on them from their perspective, to not make assumptions. I think Jane was talking about not making those assumptions and we wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, and finally, in terms of policy, um, you know, one of the, we've been, we've been working with trauma for a long time on building the trauma capacity in the region and, you know, this is something that we believe is, is it could be a really interesting alternative. I think Rachel talked about this is the moment to shift paradigms. We agree. How do you really make more trauma-informed approaches to care, for example? How do we strengthen existing public services and then also de in, engender local access and local actors in terms of mental health support within the communities themselves? Because human connection is really the best way to heal trauma. And, and, and fortunately, the, you know, one of the few kind of opportunities that come out of, of something like COVID is this possible shift in paradigms, but it's also the understanding of the importance of mental health. So we think that this is an opportunity to really bring mental health to the fore as well. Um, we also believe that the narrative around migration there's a lot, we advocate for asylum and the right to migrate, which is so important. We also need to work on um, enforcing people's right to stay home safely and thrive. So we believe that there's more of a narrative that needs to be built around people who, the majority of whom, uh, people who are forcefully displaced and forcefully migrate would rather be home. And then finally, how do we adapt, um, and I think, both Jane and Rachel mentioned this, but we need to ensure that these protection mechanisms that are in place shift quickly um, to understanding the perspective of women and girls. And given all the data we have about the importance of investing in girls and women globally, this is when we can really push this forward in policy. This is when we can really push forward the role of women and girls in responding, in recovering, and, and like, um, uh, like Rachel said, envisioning a completely new future in, our, in our, all of our societies and the globe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Selena. It was a great presentation. Uh, great to know about all the work that Glasswing is doing. Now our last panelist is from uh, World University Service of uh, Canada, uh, Stephanie McBride. She's an education advisor at WUSC, World University Service of Canada, which is one of the NGOs in Canada that have been active in refugees for many, many years. Stephanie McBride has assumed a variety of roles at WUSC over the past six years, including management of the Kenya Equity Project and Education Projects, which support refugee girls' education. Prior to this, 
Stephanie worked with the UNDP in Zimbabwe. She has a master in international development and right now is pursuing a master's in education. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much, Frank. Um, I'll share my screen here. And I hope everyone can see okay. All right, so thanks so much. Much. Uh, it's great to be here and have this opportunity to talk a bit more about the work that we've been doing and response to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm currently the Education Advisor at World University Service of Canada. Uh, we focus mostly on education, economic opportunities and empowerment of women, young people and refugees. Uh, very quick background uh, into what I'll be talking about today, uh, looking at a little bit of a different context than some of our other panelists, uh, focusing a bit more on protracted refugee contexts, and specifically in Northern Kenya. Uh, WUSC does have a number of uh, programs focusing on education provision for refugee and host communities in South Sudan and Northern Uganda, uh, as well as in Kenya, in both Dadaab and, and Kukuma refugee camps. Our programs in South Sudan and Uganda are starting up more recently. So mostly today what I'll be talking about is the, the research and the findings that we've had um, from our longer term programs in, in northern Kenya. Um, so we've already heard a lot about some of the global challenges around COVID-19. I think, you know, we're all seeing it every day, the impact that uh, this pandemic is having. But just to provide a kind of high level snapshot of some of the livelihoods impacts. Um, so the ILO has estimated that half of the global workforce's livelihoods are at risk, which is a staggering number. Um, a really interesting report recently from the Center for Global Development uh, issued a report around the impact specifically on refugee communities and highlighted that many of the sectors that are highly impacted, such as manufacturing, accommodation, food services, retail trade, um, real estate, globally around 60% of employed refugees work in these highly impacted sectors relative to 37% of populations, of host populations. So to show that the, because of the specific vulnerabilities around, you know, person-to-person -person contact, customer service-facing work, um, refugees, many of whom are in kind of retail trade and, and specific, might be more likely to be impacted. Um, and we also see that women are more likely to work in these highly impacted um, customer service-facing sectors. 42% um, of women working in those sectors as opposed to 32% of men. And women are also more likely to be represented in the informal sector. So the vulnerability from the livelihoods perspective, um, refugee women in particular are, are high risk in many variations, um, but kind of globally on, on average. Um, and as we've also seen, uh, um, there's kind of a shadow pandemic, as it's been referred to, of kind of increases in intimate partner violence um, in some sticks from countries such as Spain, uh, United States. We saw kind of a 30% uptick in calls to domestic violence hotlines. Um, and then again, as we've seen from other presenters, um, even higher uh, in some cases. Um, so, I mean, those are just the immediate concerns as well. Uh, of course, as I think we all know, COVID will have longer term impacts um, on and, and kind of a ripple effect um, after these immediate livelihood concerns as well. So bringing it from kind of the global to the local um, in the context that our education project is working in in northern Kenya. So, you know, we are an education project, um, not a livelihoods project. Although, of course, understanding the uh, quite important connection there between education and livelihoods and in, you know, low income contexts, in refugee contexts, the purpose of education in many families mindsets is very understandably to access employment. Um, and with this loss of livelihoods, the resulting impact on, you know, motivation, uh, of interest in continuing education, perceptions of the worth 
how worthwhile it is to continue your education, those are all really important considerations as well. So we recently, in uh, July, conducted a kind of quick, rapid gender analysis um, of beneficiaries in our, our context. So 49 interviews uh, remotely with a range of uh, folks from counselors, head teachers, some NGO workers, um, and girls themselves. Across all of the interviews, loss of livelihoods was the most frequently mentioned challenge way more so than, than COVID-19 itself. Uh, many markets are closing in Bostadab and, and Kakuma refugee camps. Um, refugees who work for, for NGOs as incentive workers because so many NGOs have had slowdowns in activities. Um, they're not getting paid. There's lower demand for services. And even for those who are able to continue working, um, many are reporting that business is, is slow, um, income is reduced, and many refugees relying on remittances um, from home are also no longer receiving them or receiving a diminished amount. So loss of livelihoods was really the key challenge identified by, by everyone we consulted um, and kind of related to all those uh, important variables, food insecurity, access to sanitary pads and other resources that are typically uh, provided at schools, school feeding programs, um, and more. And I mean, as other presenters have also uh, talked about, this uh, increase in intimate partner violence and exploitative uh, practices, both sexual and labor exploitation. So in an increase in transactional sex, forced marriage and exploitative child labor practices. And as I mentioned, student stress motivation um, is a really important factor here as well. The government of Kenya uh, at this time have announced that uh, school will be resuming in January uh, 2021. So that's almost you know a full eight, nine months of school interruption and that students will be restarting their year. So if you started uh, class eight at the beginning of, of 2020, you're starting class eight again at the beginning of uh, 2021. So this has had a big impact on motivation for learners. So I just have a, a quote here um, from one of the health workers that we contacted during our, our rapid gender analysis, really just hammering home the impact um, on our the population that we work with, which is adolescent girls, young women um, in kind of upper primary to secondary school. Uh, girls are idling in the community school. They were provided with basic needs. Now what they're being supplied with is not enough. They must go and get a man who buys basic needs and they're getting pregnant. Um, I mean, I think we've seen from other similar health crises, such as the Ebola pandemic, that uh, girls are most vulnerable during this period of, of interrupted school, and that pregnancy is often on the rise, and of course that makes it just that much harder for girls to return to school um, after school, school resumes. So uh, I wanted to talk Talk about what we are doing in, in response and how we're trying to support uh, the girls and young women that we work with during this time. So um, Selena and other panelists just mentioned you know the importance of social safety nets and so we've been focusing on that a lot. Uh, we have already been providing cash transfers to many of our beneficiaries in um, this context focusing on those girls who are facing multiple marginalizations, um, girls who potentially have a disability themselves or their parent or guardian has a disability, um, girls who are from child-headed households. And we have been focusing the provision of cash transfers uh, to those girls facing multiple marginalizations. With COVID, we have expanded uh, the reach of those cash transfers and through uh, our two different education-focused programs in, in Kenya, um, we've been reaching an additional uh, 2,000 girls. Um, we're still scaling up, but this is, this is our aim to be able to reach an additional 2,000. And this is really focused at reducing economic pressures, disincentivizing early marriage, child labor, transactional sex. Um, 
a pure kind of social protection intervention. Um, and this is you know, mitigating loss of livelihoods. We're still facing some challenges in delivering these cash transfers um, for those families who do not have ability to access mobile money, having to travel to the bank to access their funds, and of course, mobility and, and travel has been an issue during COVID. So still some challenges there in terms of implementation. But what we're hearing from parents, um, as you can see from, from this quote, uh, this father of a, a class eight girl saying it's the best thing that the organization has done during this period. Um, he's, you know, buying sanitary items for his daughter. He's using 80% of the transfer and trying to save 20% for other emergencies. So um, we're hearing that this is, is having a very positive impact um, in terms of en enabling social protection. One other area um, that we're working on is radio programming. We have already been delivering um, radio programs and we were focusing prior to COVID on issues such as um, emphasizing the importance of girls' education, um, conversations about household chore burden and some of the other barriers to education. And those are still important issues during this pandemic, but in response to the more urgent needs, particularly around domestic violence and early marriage, um, we've adapted our programming to focus on those areas. And previously, prior to COVID, we were having this issue of, you know, mostly men participating and listening to radio programs, as you can see from the chart here, you know, up to 80% of listeners of these programs were, were men. And we were trying to reach more women through the program, but um, at this point in time, how can we leverage this largely male listenership um, in order to amplify this programming around intimate partner violence, around early marriage? Um, so we have roughly 2,500 active participants um, in our latest series of radio shows. So when we say active participants, um, that's folks who are, are uh, texting in to the radio station, um, calling into the show. And uh, the, as I said, the listenership data shows mostly men, and we hope that this opportunity for engagement um, can, can uh, help mitigate some of these harmful social norms. Peer support, um, so many presenters have talked about mental health and how this is really critical during this time period of, of stress, uncertainty. So we're working with our school counselors to engage uh, secondary students in WhatsApp groups, sometimes just for social, social support, chatting about what's going on, sometimes for discussion uh, about more academic related topics delivering remote counseling via phone as well um, to girls and so counselors are able to, to work with those girls that they whose cases they were previously managing and increasingly as restrictions have changed somewhat in Kenya to allow for slightly larger gatherings um, we've been coordinating um, small in-person support groups for girls living in camps to give them a chance to discuss with peers do some activities, um, alleviate the boredom, the confusion, the frustration um, of this stressful time period. We're also working with teachers themselves. Um, just as students are feeling the uncertainty and the stress, uh, teachers are as well. We work with both uh, national Kenyan teachers um, who teach in host community schools or some who teach in refugee schools. And we also work with refugee teachers um, who are unqualified uh, as teachers but um, have attained a certain level of education and are, and are teaching in, in refugee contexts. And so there's a continuous need for training, ongoing support for those teachers. And during this period, the question that we had was, you know, how do we keep them engaged? How do we, you know, leverage the time that they have on their hands to help support parents at home. Um, many parents themselves may be illiterate um, and while they understand the importance of supporting their child's education, they may not know how, they may not have the tools or resources to do so. So we've started to facilitate small remedial sessions um, with some of the girls who were already participating in our remedial education classes, which are 
catch up classes that we organize on the weekends um, just to help girls who are feeling a bit behind in school. They're kind of girls only smaller classroom sizes um, to provide that supportive atmosphere for learning. So we've been coordinating that on a smaller level. And then we're really working as well to provide remote resources to teachers through recorded WhatsApp videos and audio to teacher groups, uh, covering a pretty wide range of topics uh, that are relevant during this time period. COVID-19 facts, resources to refer students to, how teachers can support parents to encourage learning at home, gender-based violence and resources for students. So giving teachers those resources so that they can then transmit them on to students. We want students to have access to, to those um, resources and, and referral networks from multiple vantage points. And then also supporting teachers with planning and preparedness for back to school. And finally, working with uh, local partners, community-based organizations, and refugee-led organizations in the community to support uh, back-to-school campaigns in January 2021. So that's a picture of a bit of what we've been doing uh, along with our partner, Wendell International Kenya, to mitigate some of the impact of COVID-19 and to hopefully be able to transition back into a school year if if we should in fact reopen back in January and not lose out on those girls who were previously enrolled in school making sure that we get every one of those girls back into school is our hope and dream. So just a, a quick note on policy solutions moving forward for practitioners like WUSC like our partners um, we're really focusing on cash in hand for affected populations. Um, during this time, the social safety net is so, so important. And we don't want to lose a generation of girls to this pandemic and lose out on all their potential and future opportunities. So we're focusing on direct assistance um, and to the extent we can cash in hand. It's also an important advocacy moment to promote the integration of refugees in national school systems, national social safety nets. Um, COVID has shown us that, you know, more so than ever, if one of us is vulnerable, all of us are vulnerable. And to neglect a population of refugees um, living in a camp, for example, is not a sustainable strategy because that infection can spread. We need to support all of our most vulnerable communities equally and move forward um, together on that basis. We're also thinking about addressing the digital divide. Um, access to technology is a challenge for refugees uh, on the move and refugees in protracted contexts. We know that most families do have um, access to a phone, but that phone is probably in the hands of the father or mother, head of the house, um, and not in the hands of the girls themselves. So what can we do in this period to address that digital divide, um, both for addressing COVID-19 impacts and for the future? And then more broadly for policymakers, I would say um, we're seeing a lot of um, refugees who, you know, previously worked in healthcare um, have had to flee from their country of origin, and they have skills that they can offer um, if their credentials are fast tracked, if they're supported um, to work in in systems. There's a lot that people can contribute. It's also shown us funding for refugee-led organizations that can mobilize on the ground is critical. Um, this work can't you know, be done all by international NGOs who, you know, have staff members who had to repatriate at the beginning of, of COVID-19. We need to invest in local organizations that have that ability to mobilize on the ground. And then finally, um, addressing xenophobia head on. It's, it's a really fascinating and uh, interesting time where more so than ever, we see how interconnected we all are and yet at the same time, for many, the response has been, 
wanting to shut doors to amplify nationalist and, and xenophobic rhetoric. Um, but we, we really know now how interconnected we all are and we need to address uh, xenophobia head on, um, both for the sake of, of refugees and other displaced populations and for all of us. Um, so I'll leave it there and look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists for providing such interesting insights on this important topic. So we do have a, quite a few questions that have come through. Um, I'm going to start with asking two of the questions and then um, going into our next round. So the first question that I'm going to ask is how can um, we use technology in refugee settings to support women, especially in cases where data is hard to get in camps um, or, or there's this huge di digital divide? And then the second question that I have is, um, or that the participants have, is how can we use participatory action research or how can that be done when there's difficulty accessing refugees during lockdown and difficult gaining um, qualitative data collection or data? And I'll open it up to the floor. Quickly, I'll try to answer. I was about to submit my typing, my typed answer, but um, I think in terms of technology, it is absolutely critical right now, I think, to support women. The issue is um, just make sure they have the So it's important to make sure they do have access to uh, phones with credit on them or just innovate with phone companies and partner with phone companies to be able to provide women with information. Um, which we're trying to do more of these kind of partnerships with, with phone companies. And then in terms of the participatory action research, um, I, you know, when you're involved in communities long term, you actually, we have employees in, in communities, we have volunteers in communities. So in the past, before COVID, we did do peer groups amongst uh, women that had been deported. Um, and we've done this before. So during COVID, I think having that permanent presence in communities gives you ongoing access. Um, yes, it is hard to find and it's difficult to uh, just access um, refugees, particularly women or displaced persons. But, um, you know, we, we, we definitely have been able to do that. And I think with unaccompanied minors in particular, we do think going to be interested in these kind of virtual support groups as well and having that ongoing case management based on our experience in the past. So um, we will, we'll keep you posted on that, but we do think this will be, um, this will be feasible and it's important. Thank you. Um, I will. <laughs> Join in just just quickly to echo the the just the phone. Uh, um, it's something that we'd we'd encountered a lot in terms of access to information um, and and having a phone on you, particularly for refugees and migrants on the move, is vital. Um, uh, and I think being able to access that phone it, it means you yeah you access information, you can contact uh, helplines, you can uh, express your needs. Uh, there are feedback mechanisms uh, in place. Um, and and also for education. I mean, there's, there's so much that could be done, and I think this is this is really a vital point um, in terms of research. It's the same thing as well. There's, there's you use the population. Uh, this is how, uh, thankfully, for him, I was able to to adapt. Is because it it uses researchers who are on the ground and, and in place. And yes, it was it was remote, but um, but it helps that a lot of our monitors are parts of those communities. Thank you. I'll um, go to the next set of questions. Um, there are a couple that, that group well together. One of the questions that we received are, what a best practice should the major country donors focus on for ODA responding to COVID-19? And similarly, another question is, if one works for a bilateral development agency and wants to improve the situation of women migrants and refugees, where should the money go? Should it be sent to multilateral UN agencies? If not, where else in what sectors? And similarly, just uh, one, one that we can add on there is what are some of the policies host countries 
are developing to continue to welcome refugees during these times? Leave it to the panelist. Maybe I can I can jump in on the on the multilateral funding. Um, we all smiled a little bit um, because I think uh, the, really the gist of uh, some of the things that we were saying is that we really need to invest in communities because communities really have shown again that they're at the front line of health crises. They're the ones who are the front line of the socio and economic crises that they're living through. And they're the ones that really need to be supported. And often the very vulnerable and isolated communities like migrants and refugees are the ones who get left to the side in a lot of this uh, funding. It's, you know, we have a chronic underfunding of multilateral agencies. Um, and often the decisions and policies that are made are very far away from the realities on the ground. And I think when we're trying to talk about having a more granular, um, community appropriate, culturally appropriate, socially appropriate responses, we have to really focus on the community. And communities need resources. And they need resources to be able to respond. We can't rely on communities always providing volunteers um, to do these things uh, when they need to secure their own so their own economic security. It's it's become a bit of a of a kind of a way of operating is relying on these bands of volunteers in extremely impoverished and vulnerable communities, which to me is uh, really not the way to go. If we want sustainable responses, resilient communities, we should be paying people on the ground to be able to lead their communities. So I would say, to cut a long story short, we should be funding more communities directly and or community organisations that are helping to empower and provide that agency that communities need to respond in health crises. So it really would be a re reformulating of the way that funding is currently um, passed out. Thanks. I'll just um, chime in briefly uh, to add to what Rachel said. I mean, <clears throat> sorry, definitely agree that more funding needs to go to community-based organizations. Um, that's where the most relevant direct assistance is. I think it's often tricky because, I mean, multilaterals also have a very critical role to play um, in terms of being able to reach scale um, and being able to, you know, have, have that mobilization ability for a, a broader community. It can be harder when there is a sense of urgency, um, like what we're, we're working with in our context now, you know, we want to start delivering cash transfers right away to prevent as many girls from, you know, dropping out or having resort to, you know, for example, transactional sex as possible. So there's an urgency element, of course, but in long term investments in local community organizations are going to be more sustainable, more impactful. So um, how can we, incentivize or support um, multilaterals who have more of that that scope to direct funding to work with um, community organizations you know for example in our cash transfer programs we do rely on UNHCR to validate um, banking information to validate refugee registration information how can we accelerate that process um, and how can we you know, support multilaterals and smaller community organizations uh, to work together more? I don't have a perfect answer for how to do that, but yeah, I, I do think there's a, an important balance there. Great, I'll, I'll end with one last round um, of questions. Um, one is how do we make cash transfer sustainable? Will it affect our programs post COVID-19? And the second is, should our approach be different in a mass camp such as Daudab in Kenya or Cox Bazar in Bangladesh? Sorry, Lava, I didn't hear the last part of that. Should should our approach be different in a context like Dadab or Kukuma? Yeah, in, in mass camps where populations are, are significant. Mm. Um, I mean, I can just uh, chime in on that 
quickly um, and then leave the floor open um, for, for others. I mean, I, clearly there's very different needs and vulnerabilities for communities that are on the move versus communities in kind of more protracted situations and, you know, different sets of, of risks and vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, also in a camp context versus an urban refugee context, um, in a context where most refugees are urban, uh, such as in the, the case of Jordan, for example, there's perhaps better chance of accessing livelihoods, opportunities, um, whereas in a camp context, the economy is so dependent around NGOs, the density, the population density issues are different. And, you know, with communities on the move, um, the, the risks are related to mobility are, are very high. So very different sets of issues. I think reaching populations on the move with, for example, cash transfers um, is very challenging. Um, finding ways to you know, transfer mobile money or to get folks to access a bank. Uh, there's a lot of just logistical challenges there. So I think different types of, of needs for, for every community. We, we have to take different approaches in all of those, those contexts. Um, and then in terms of the sustainability of cash transfers, it's, it's definitely a tricky one, I think, but I think we are increasingly seeing national governments um, in other, I mean, Latin America really kind of championed um, the cash transfer as, you know, a government social safety net program. And I think we're increasingly seeing other countries around the world adopting that. Um, there's no reason why a cash transfer or a universal basic income um, can't be, you know, an important part of a national social, social safety net program. Um, and I think in terms of making cash transfers sustainable, um, that's perhaps, you know, the long-term vision. I'll uh, leave it there. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, adding to the cash transfers conversation, I think um, it is, I mean, during a crisis, very few things can be sustainable, right? Like this is an emergency. So I think um, sometimes you just have to put aside the sustainability piece and respond to what's most needed. Um, one thing we have had to factor in when we do give cash transfers to migrants in the U.S. and also um, in Latin America, whenever we're doing any sort of transfer of resources that can put people at risk, including technological devices, we have to make sure we factor in that they may be in a household that's risky. Um, so how do you get that? And that most likely they will not have a bank account. So how do we get that cash in hand to women in a way that's safe? And that's why it's so important to engage local clinics when school's out, like what, what's the only institution that's open right now is the clinic, right? They can't go to faith-based institutions. So, so it's being really resourceful. And again, asking what, you know, what makes sense to you? What's most helpful to you? Do you prefer that we buy you $30 in food or do you want the cash? I think it's a lot of back and forth and um, asking because it changes. But I think sometimes we just in right now, given the economic impacts, we can't, we can't think too much about what's going to be sustainable later. And we're going to have to, with some things, with some things we can, but right now I think the systemic change with cash transfers would be amazing. And, um, and, and maybe it'll go that way if we can prove right now that during this emergency, we were able to keep people afloat um, during a really extreme crisis. So thanks for that question though. All right, anyone else would like to intervene on that question? Rachel, Jane? Just, yeah, very quickly, if that's okay. It's interesting that people in such completely different settings are voicing the, the need for cash. Um, and it is, again, it's down to context, it's down to the practicalities and the logistics, which is really important, and, and the particularities of these people's situations, which is why you need to know what what the people need themselves you have to talk to these women and you have to find out and i think i think if we take anything away that's that's what's really important is is to understand that it is yeah it's about the community and what the women need and, and how we can meet those needs best and and yes we're in a crisis and it's on a massive scale but but to actually meet the needs in the in the right way you have to go down to that much uh, smaller local scale and just to add on to what, what Jane said, if I may, I think that this is part of the paradigm shift 
um, that COVID-19 is, is revealing for us and it's time to actually take advantage of that and really move towards actually doing what the community needs rather than policy that's developed far away um, by people who would, with all the best intentions don't actually know the reality of being in that small village in El Salvador and the community in Nunavut. Um, we need to give the, the, the power to the communities themselves and put the community first. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Rachel. So um, this is great. I look at the time and the time is, has flown by, really. Uh, on behalf of all the, the participants here, I'd like to, to thank our panel. Uh, Rachel Kittle Monroe from Sea Change, MSF, and of course McGill. Uh, Jane Lanikard from Mix Migration Center. Selena De Sola from Glasswing International. And Stephanie McBride from World University Service of Canada, WISC. So thank you for a great presentation, uh, all of you, and great discussion. And uh, we're now looking at the calendar, and I realize that um, our eighth and last webinar series is, is, is about to go. And on our next last one will be on August 18, and it will be a discussion on global governance with respect to COVID-19 and women in power. So on this, I'd li also would like to invite you to uh, look uh, at Women's Empowerment uh, series on the, our web lab, and it's web womensempowerment.lab.mcgill.ca where you'll be able to find a recording soon of this webinar as well as all the previous webinars and information. So on this, I thank you very much. I wish you a great day, and we look forward to seeing you on August 18. Thank you.